what I found was that I had been asking the wrong question my entire life. The question what I should be eating, it's a question that no other animal asks. No other animal goes to nutritionists or hires people to tell them how they should eat. No other animal goes to the bookstore and buys all kinds of diet books to tell them what they should be eating. All other animals eat a diet that their bodies are designed to do naturally and they listen to the, um, the evolutionary signals that have hard, been hardwired into their bodies to allow them to understand, you know, yes, I should eat this. No, I shouldn't eat this. This food makes me feel good. This food makes me feel bad. This food will kill me. And they understand it naturally. That they don't ask that question. We shouldn't have to ask that question. The question we should have been asking, I should have been asking my whole life. And I think the question that anyone trying to really transform their life um, and their health through diet and food is to ask the question, how should I be eating? For, for all of evolutionary history, like you were talking about, we, we developed these technologies to be able, for the main purpose, to enhance nutrient availability. And now we've done the opposite. And now we value uh, profitability, shelf life, and all these other things. Welcome to the Live Damn Well podcast. My name is Jorge Roman, and my guest today is Dr. Bill Schindler, Associate Professor of Anthropology and Archaeology at Washington College in Chestertown, Maryland. He's a primitive technologist and a chef. Dr. Schindler is also the founder and director of the Eastern Shore Food Lab and a co-star of the National Geographic series, The Great Human Race. Dr. Schindler, thank you for joining me. That is my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So we're going to dive into a lot today. You know, after I had uh, Brian Sanders on the show from Food Lies and Sapien, mm -hmm. uh, I knew I really wanted to talk to you. I got introduced to your work and a little bit about what you do. And I really wanted to get away from overhyped, overfunded Netflix documentaries and get into, <laughs> you know, archaeological research and your firsthand sure. experience, which I think is super valuable. So uh, let's get into a little bit of your backstory. So how did you get into all this stuff? Ooh, that's, that's a great question. Uh, first off, let me say I'm so glad you talked to Brian. Brian's Brian's doing amazing work, and his take on all of this is 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 wonderful. He's such a a great support for uh, support of everything that I do, and also uh, you know a leader in this field. So I'm, I'm glad you got to speak with him um, and, and share his work with everyone. I my I, I took a roundabout sort of uh, path to to what I'm doing now, and even though for a long period of my life, I felt like I was floundering and didn't know, you know what I was doing and, and where and direction I was going. It turns out that all those different pieces of my life have come together in uh, the approach and the research that, that I'm doing now. So the, the, the quicker, shorter version of, of all of it is, you know, I grew up, I grew up in New Jersey on the, uh, near the shore, not, not far from where they filmed Jersey Shore, if anybody's ever watched that. Um, that show, and about five miles from the beach, near New York City. Uh, most of my friends' parents were, uh, you know, worked in New York City and commuted, weren't home a whole lot. Uh, but, but my parents had me in the kitchen, in the woods, hunting, fishing, trapping, camping, hiking. As uh, you know, despite living in the suburbs of New Jersey, I had a really well-rounded uh, youth outside and, under, and and learning to understand this or at least appreciate this connection with the world around me at some level. My father and I was also in the kitchen a bunch of my mother, my gran grandmothers loved watching, um, uh, uh, what's her name? The, the French chef. Uh, oh my gosh, I don't know why it's escaping, the mind's escaping me. Every, everybody who's listening knows exactly what I'm talking about. Julie Child. I mean, I would watch Julie Child when I was five years old on a little black and white TV and just wish I could get into her kitchen. And so I was always dealing with food and getting food from the environment and started forging when I was 10 years old or so. But at the same time, I had this incredibly unhealthy relationship with food. I was overweight, uh, pudgy, low muscle tone, um, you know, and I had this body image that was, in, uh, you know, the, that was terrible. It, it was very, very unhealthy. Not only was I unhealthy, but the way I felt about myself was unhealthy and living near the beach wasn't helpful, right? You know, the fact that we would go to the beach all the time and, and I was I was one of those kids that sat there. I had my t-shirt on all the time. Uh, even if I went into the water, I'd come out and the t-shirt was there clinging to my body, thinking it was a shield and nobody could see the fat rolls and all the, but it, it was mentally, it was what I was doing. And so an unhealthy relationship with food. I didn't see food. I saw the value of being in the kitchen because I was with my mother and my grandparents. I saw the value of hunting uh, with my, because I was with my dad, um, but I didn't ever feel that connection with food that it was something that nourished me. And I know that sounds strange, but it was this idea that the you know, food made me fat. 
food made me look a certain way so that other kids made fun of me. Um, and it wasn't something that nourished me in my mind, at least. So then um, I started wrestling in high school and I became an athlete and my diet didn't change much, uh, but I was so working out three, four times a day. So my body changed its shape. I wasn't healthy, but I looked like an athlete. And I, but I had this, I traded one unhealthy relationship with food for another. I went from, you know, thinking that food was something that made me fat, made other kids make fun of me, to food was something I was scared of because it was going to cause me to miss weight because I was, I was a wrestler. Um, I ended up wrestling at Ohio State, an amazing division one program, same thing that, that unhealthy relationship with food continued in that weird food's going to make me miss weight sort of pattern. And then when I stopped working out, everything that I experienced before I was an athlete came back. You know, now I was in my, in my mid to late twenties, all the weight came back on and I tried every fad diet. I tried South beach. I tried weight watchers. I tried, I, I tried everything. And even though my weight would fluctuate, I was starting now to experience in this little bit of an older body. You know, I wasn't a 10 year old pudgy kid. I was a 30 year old pudgy overweight man. And I was experiencing all sorts of, of issues from, from, you know, irritable bowel syndrome to, you know, restless legs, pain, joint pain, all sorts of crazy things that I never associated all of it with diet. Um, I was diving down this rabbit hole to try to figure out what I should be eating in order to be the healthiest I could be. And none of it was working. And to sort of put a, uh, to, to wrap up the, this part of it, what I found when I started to realize answers that literally transformed my life. I am now 48 years old, and I am healthier now than I've been any other moment in my life. And that includes when I was a Division I college athlete. What I found was that I had been asking the wrong question my entire life. The question, what I should be eating, it's a question that no other animal asks. No other animal goes to nutritionists or hires people to tell them how they should eat. No other animal goes to the bookstore and buys all kinds of diet books to tell them what they should be eating. All other animals eat a diet that their bodies are designed to do naturally, and they listen to the, um, the evolutionary signals that have hard, been hardwired into their bodies to allow them to understand, you know, yes, I should eat this. No, I shouldn't eat this. This food makes me feel good. This food makes me feel bad. This food will kill me. And they understand it naturally. That they don't ask that question. We shouldn't have to ask that question. The question we should have been asking, I should have been asking my whole life, but I think the question that anyone trying to really transform their life um, and their health through diet and food is to ask the question, how should I be eating? And I'm sure we'll dive into this uh, much more in, in a few minutes, but here's the, um, uh, th this is what I call eating like a human. What humans do differently than other animals, is that we eat foods that we are not designed to eat. Biologically, we have an incredibly inefficient digestive tract and physically, we don't have the um, characteristics that other animals have that allow them to access food very easily from their environment. We can't run very fast. We can't, you know, we can't fly. We can't dig into the ground well. We can't swim very well. We can't see really far. You know, we can't do all of these things that allow other animals to to hunt or to dig for tubers or to do all these, you know, climb and, 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 and get different things. So we, we, we don't have that ability. What we do as humans, and this is the most important thing that I can say for the entire hour we're gonna to be together. What we have done as humans for three and a half million years, and what we should be focusing on now is creating technologies and approaches to food that make food as safe and nourishing as possible for our bodies before the food even touches our lips. That's how we built ourselves, our humans as, as a species, both biologically and culturally. And that's the way we should be approaching our food today to be as healthy as we can be. We're gonna dive into a lot of that way more in depth, but that was an amazing introduction. I think, um, you know, basically what you're saying is we've disconnected from the way that we relate to our food. And um, that's been, you know, going on for the last few centuries, I think way more than ever before. And we're going to talk about exactly why that's such an issue. But first, I want to sure. set the scene a little bit. Um, you took part in this National Geographic series called The Great Human Race, and you got to live pretty much exactly how our ancestors lived during different periods of evolutionary, you know, our evolutionary history. And you did that firsthand. So tell me a little bit about that experience and what you learned. Yeah, that was a... You know 
my uh, graduate school advisor when I was doing my PhD at Temple University told me I was in the middle of you know, studying it. I mean, I was I literally piles of books, looked like a cartoon. I was reading all, you know, all the time, getting ready for my exams and the peach. And I was frustrated and, and, and tired and exhausted and spent. And I remember having a conversation with him. Like, well, you should, you should be celebrating this. Like, you should be so excited right now. I'm like, you're out of your damn mind. I've never studied so hard in my life. He's like, this is the last time in your life, the only time in your life that you're going to be able to dedicate yourself to learning something you know, uh, completely, just dive in completely. So relish it because it's never going to happen again. I'm like, oh, I get it. Well, you know what? That experience in National Geographic was my second chance to do that. In fact, it was even more powerful than studying for my PhD. Um, yeah, I, that that show was such an uh, important part of my life and it certainly set the trajectory for a lot of the research that I'm doing now. Um, and it's very quick, what we did with that show, and National Geographic was brilliant. What they wanted to do in the creation of that show was sort of capitalize on that uh, survival TV genre that was so, it still is kind of big now, but was really big six or so years ago. And instead, it, and at the time, the survival TV genre, you know, the new shows that were coming out were starting to get really, really silly and out there. Like they were getting to the place where they'd take and they'd handcuff two people together and just stick them in the woods to see you know, how they would survive. Like they were, they were, the networks were stretching really far to, you know, make a new and different survival show. But what National Geographic decided to do is let, let's take this platform, the survival TV sort of tidal wave that's happening and use it to tell a real story, a story of our shared human experience, a story that otherwise might not be accessible because it might be kind of boring to a lot of people. Let's do it through that lens. And that's exactly what they did. So they took me and my co-star, Kat Bigney, and we had 10 episodes, and we started at two and a half million years ago in Tanzania, which is crazy because at the time that we developed the show, that was the place and the location of the first stone tool ever found. And now we know uh, there's stone tools that date back to almost three and a half million years ago, almost by a million years earlier in Kenya. But for the best information that we had, we started there, and the idea was we identified 10 different periods of time over the past two and a half million years that there was a you know a technology or an approach that our ancestors developed that allowed us to overcome our physical limitations interact with our environment in a brand new way and like take another step in in, in our evolutionary path and what we were supposed you know my job was to replicate the technologies from that time period using the same tools and materials and then we were supposed to survive or subsist for a period of about 10 days at a time in those locations representing the time periods that we were you know supposed to be representing so we use those tools to access our food to make shelter to protect ourselves those sorts of things and at the same time we were trying to tell a story that what was so cool about it was that up until the last few episodes which were representing only a few thousand years ago the entirety of uh, most of the time we were out there was representative of a, of a past that everyone in the world, no matter where you lived, what your religion is, what your politics are, what your sexual orientation are, no matter what it is, no matter, no matter who you were, if you were human, this is your story. And I thought that was incredibly powerful. But for me, for my research, I hate to, to, to I told myself a long time ago that I, I, I knew I, I loved to teach, but I never wanted to be in a place where I was teaching things that I hadn't experienced. And in archaeology, that's a really hard thing to do. I mean, you're talking about things that, of course, you never experienced. You're talking about something that happened 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago. Well, this was my chance. Like, this was my chance to actually experience, even though it was for a limited time, about 10 days or two weeks at a time or so. Um, that's long enough to feel scared. That's long enough to feel triumphant. That's long enough to realize that the tool you actually made was effective or it wasn't going to work at all. And that's certainly long enough to start to begin to feel how the diet that you're eating at in the then that's reflective of the diet of that time period, how that makes you feel compared to the diet that you typically would have. And this is a sort of side note, but I think you're incredibly powerful. So there's one of our head camera, our head camera guy, uh, Luke Cormack, fantastic cameraman. Um, he had the sort of unfortunate job of literally staring at me through a lens of a camera for you know all day long day after day week after week month after month um and you know just right there focused focused on uh, on me and on cat but he was looking at my face a lot and the way the show would work is we would leave for about 
six weeks at a time and film two episodes. So we'd go to our location, we'd go and live with some indigenous or traditional group in that area, get to learn a lot about the animals and the plants that were there and the things we should watch out for and things we should be doing. Um, I'd have already made or prepped a lot of the materials for the tools and then we would start. And when we would film, what you saw on screen is what you got. Like we were living in that way for, you know, period of 10 days, two weeks, whatever it was. And then we would wrap up that episode go and we go go to the next place, usually stay in a really nice hotel for like a day or two and then go out and film the next episode. And then I'd go home for two weeks, uh, see my family, prep some more tools and things and then go do that again. And we did that since each one was two episodes, we do that five different times. So it's just really weird, you know, I would get thrown into 200,000 years ago life for a certain, then I'd get pulled out of it and be in a five-star hotel. Then I'd be back into it. And then I'd be home for two weeks and it was, it was really weird. But what happened during that time period was the food I was eating was changing. Like I would go from literally scavenging. I would, we, we scavenged animals on the African savannah in the first episode and they raw marrow out of the bones and flesh that had been sitting there for however long. And then, you know, two weeks later, I'm in a beautiful place. And then I'm, then I'm home and I'm eating the diet that I usually eat. And my diet was, was fairly good at that time anyhow. But what Luke said about halfway through the season. So we had filmed several episodes already. He goes, you know, it is so crazy. I'm looking at your face. And he says, I know you're healthy. I, I, I see it. But I see your eyes change. I see your face change over a, a period of time once we begin filming each episode. Like you start a certain way and two, three, four days into this episode, everything brightens. Like I literally see your eyes brighten. I see your face change. And it's fascinating because, you know, here I am, I'm literally scavenging, we're foraging, we're hunting, we're not eating the amount of food that a typical American would consider the amount of food we should be eating. Um, I'm feeling in many cases somewhat hungry. Um, and my, I, you know, he sees, he, what, what he perceives through his lens is he sees me getting healthier every time. And then I leave, I get thrown back into the modern world you know, all of whatever's happening comes back. And then I start again. And to me, it was fascinating. And I love that moment because it's true. I, I felt healthy. I felt alive. And uh, I, certainly there were struggles. There were a lot of struggles. There were times, there were lots of issues. But, um, you know, we did live, Kat and I are the only two people in the world that have ever lived all the different major time periods of our evolutionary past. And I don't want to overstate it because, again, it wasn't like we lived each period for five years at a time, but we experienced so many of the physical and emotional responses that I truly believe somebody at that time period would have, that it gives, it provided at least me, at least what I perceive as a, a really good insight into what that was like and how important it is to reconnect with what our diets were like in the past. Now, pulling from your, uh, you know, your archaeological, anthropological background, and the fact that you already knew a lot about ancestral living, what were those, you know, if you had to whittle it down, those most important lessons and the things that really surprised you from doing it firsthand? Hmm. The, the, one, of the, one of the biggest lessons that has nothing to do with food, it has more to do with just straight archaeology, is you know, I've been involved with primitive technologies and experimental archaeologies for a, a large part of my life, uh, made Know, thousands of stone tools, use them in different experiments, use them with students, did certain things. Um, but I've never had to rely on those tools. Uh, so if you would have asked me 20 years ago, you know, how efficient is that knife? I mean, like, man, that knife is, is, is great. It, it's really, really sharp. I can't tell you how long it would last, but it, it, it's, it's a cool knife. You know, relying on those tools. I mean, literally, we needed those tools to live, to eat, to get food, to process food. Um, it was mind blowing the, to the realization that a stone tool can be as efficient as it really is, can be as sharp and as useful as it really is, was mind blowing. So I, I, to me as an archaeologist, to be able to, to see how efficient and how useful these tools really were was a huge takeaway for me. Um, I, on another note, what was fascinating to me as well is I, I never really did much with, with prehistoric clothing. Um, for, for a variety of different reasons until this. I spent about a little over 500 hours making all the clothes that I wore uh, throughout that series, which was great for me. I was, you know, sewing brain pan deer skin with 
sinew and all this other sort of things, which, which I really enjoyed that experience and the knowledge that I got from it. But more importantly, taking care of those clothes was very, um, uh, a huge education and, and, and eye-opening to me. What we had to do to make sure those clothes stayed viable, make, you know, um, if they got wet, there's a certain way to treat brain tan deer skin to make sure it gets back to its natural state, those, those sorts of things. Um, those were, were all mind blowing. The, as far as food's concerned, the amount of time it actually takes to forage, to feed yourself a meaningful amount of calories and nutrition from plants is in, in, an incredible amount of time. That is a mind blowing amount of time. The, uh, one thing in anthropology we always used to say, and I think a lot of people are still saying today, is that, yeah, sure, we know people would go out and hunt, but the mainstay of the diet were plants, was foraging, because it was always there. The women and the children always knew where the, not to be sexist, I'm just restating the way this is typically stated. You know, the women and the children are always out foraging, that's the main part of the diet, and yeah, the men would go out hunting, and when they got something great, when they didn't, it was, it was, it was about, it was about uh, plants. Um, the amount of time it takes to get plants a meaningful amount of plants to actually make a huge impact on the diet is absolutely incredible. And those plants, and we'll talk about this, I'm sure in a few minutes, most, all plants have some level of toxin in them. And a lot of the plants and even staples in our diet in many indigenous traditional diets today have a, a crazy amount of toxins and need to be detoxified. So there's not just a huge amount of time and effort that's spent getting and gathering those foods but they need to be detoxified through a variety of different processes that uh, take more time and take more effort. And uh, I, I guess I'll wrap this piece up as well as, you know, we had, we've had fruits in our diet since before we started making stone tools. We've had fruits in our diet for millions and millions and millions of years. And some people would take that and say, hey, well, that's great. If we ate fruits, as a, you know, our ancestors ate fruits and we should be able to go into the acme and buy bananas and oranges and apples and have, you know, not think twice about it. And they should be a healthy part of our diet. The fruits that we ate, the fruits that we had access to, wild fruits, the fruits that the Hadza in, in Tanzania are eating are nothing. They're night and day different than what we get in our produce section of our grocery stores. Almost all of them are tiny. They mostly have very, most of them have very low sugar contents. Um, most of them have huge pits or seeds or something that, you know, there's very little flesh the flesh is nowhere near as sweet as, as um, we're used to. They're, they take a long time to gather and you don't get, you don't bite into it and get a whole bunch of fruit. You bite into it and get to get a whole bunch of pith or a whole bunch of, of seeds and a little bit of flesh. So, uh, you know, all, all of that really started to reframe my thought process behind how much plants made an impact in our diets in the past and how much animal-based resources did as well. Now, I'm not sure uh, if you're aware that right now there are a few people like Eric Edmides, uh, Dr. Anthony Gustin, Dr. Paul Saladino, all of whom are kind of uh, advocates for an animal-based diet. And right now they've been with the Hadza, living with them. And that's exactly what they found. You know, they find that, sure, they have a few plant foods, but, you know, with tubers, they, they chew on them and then spit out the fiber, right? They don't, um, their main source of nutrition is animal foods, organ meats, and all things like that. And, um, but the thing I'm hearing in the back of my mind now, and, and something that a lot of my vegan friends, you know, argue about is, so there's this argument that eating ancestrally and eating this paleolithic type of eating pattern is irrelevant because we've changed since then, you know, our genetics have changed a little bit since then. So in other words, how does genetics play into our nutrition? And is there some truth to that? Yeah. <laughs> well, Remember, let, let's go back very quickly to one of the first things I said, because some of these arguments, and, and listen, let me say a, a little bit of a disclaimer uh, b beforehand. I, the, the reason, and I don't, I don't mean to even suggest that I'm a, a, an expert on vegan or vegetarian or any sort of approach to food, but from what I believe, the reason that people, the main reason that most people are vegans when they decide to be, and the reason that most people are vegetarians and most people that make whatever decisions they're making about their diets are, are incredibly honorable. I mean, they're, they're, they're fantastic reasons to make decisions about, I mean, how, what's better, uh, better thought process to decide how you feed yourself than to worry about you and your family's health, to worry about the health of the planet and to worry about the ethical treatment of the world around you. I mean, it's, that's fantastic. 
Now, with that said, I approach it in a completely different way than, than a vegan would, but I, I really appreciate and value why they're making the decisions that they're making, even though I don't agree with those decisions. Right. Um, so th that disclaimer said, um, we cannot, we should not base our decisions on how we eat by, look, by, by, by saying things like, we're not designed to eat meat or we're not designed to hunt. You know, we, we, we don't have huge canines to rip apart a carcass on the African savanna, so therefore we shouldn't be eating meat because we don't look like a saber-toothed tiger. You know, those sorts of arguments are, in, are, are, are ridiculous, and I'll tell you why. Because we are more designed biologically to eat an animal. These teeth will be able to rip something apart, right? Um, if we found it, we're more designed to eat an animal than we are a grain of wheat. We don't have, we don't, for as much as you might say, somebody might say, we don't have the ability to, you know, hunt at will and rip it apart on the savanna and devour it. And our digestive tract is perfectly suited for all those things very easily. Well, we certainly are not well suited to um, harvest with no tools whatsoever, harvest um, wheat, store it, put it in the ground, um, take care of it harvest it again, bring, uh, dry it up. We can't grind it with our hands. We can't grind it with our teeth. We can't bake it without heat. Like we are more well-designed to eat an animal than we are a bread because all of those things require technology. So with that said, here's, here's, the, here's the major thesis of all my work, which I can, think can help inform this discussion from this point forward. Humans are not designed to eat almost every single food that we eat. And we are not designed to, we don't have the capabilities, the physical capabilities to access most of those um, foods directly from our environment. We, what we do as humans, and this is the how part, not the what, is create technologies, behavior patterns, approaches that allow us to access an incredibly diverse array of resources from our environment and then process those resources to transform them into their safest and most nourishing form possible for our incredibly weak and inefficient digestive tract to fuel these huge bodies and huge brains in relation to the size of that digestive tract. That's what we've done beginning almost three and a half million years, starting with the first stone tool that allowed us to butcher animals in the African savanna and progress through the development of hunting technology, fire technology, fermentation technology, soaking, mishtamalizing, all sorts of approaches to food that allow us to do it. That's what humans do differently. So any argument that starts with, we are not designed to eat X, is uh, my, my brain shuts off because you're, you're right, we're not, but that isn't the end of the conversation. But here's the other piece that is really hard, I think, for us to wrap our brains around. For as much as we are not designed to eat almost all of the foods that we eat, we have developed technologies that allow us to eat them safely in an incredibly nourishing way. And because of that, we have built bodies, brains, body size, uh, with nutritional requirements that require those foods. It's because we've introduced those foods using the technologies we've used to introduce them into our diets that our bodies have changed over millions of years to be what they are with the nutritional requirements we have and our brains, more importantly, to be what they are with the nutritional requirements that we have. I mean, it, it's the technology related to food is so important to the conversation that the, you know, the, if you look at, if you were going to, to graph our body size and our brain size growth over three and a half million years, and then you would graph um, our tooth size and our digestive tract size, they're, they, they're, they're inverse, right? It, 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 it's the opposite. As our nutritional requirements are literally skyrocketing, our teeth, the only thing that we have in our body that physically, allow, once we put food into our mouth, that physically allows us to break food down and our digestive tract, which the size of our digestive tract is in direct proportion to what we can do, how much food we can eat at any given time and what we can do with that food. Both of those things are getting smaller. So that speaks to the power of the technology in, in the transformation of these diets. So again, it, the, the last little piece to answer your question, I don't believe, so Technology is an important part of this, um, an, an important part, and looking at our teeth, our digestive tract, uh, our fingernails, our speed, whatever, to try to understand what our diet should be is uh, uh, the wrong way to go about doing it. 
But as far as nutritional requirements go, what we need to fuel these bodies, it is important to understand that uh, modern day Homo sapiens appear about 300,000 years ago. That's the, that's what the current archaeological record suggests. And when we appear 300,000 years ago, we are essentially what we are today. Similar, we think similar size digestive tract, similar tooth size, similar brain size, similar body size. So other than how we deal with ourselves environmentally as, as a modern species, whether we're sitting on a couch or running marathons, other than our physical activity, our bodies essentially need the same food from the diets that built us 300,000 years ago today as much as we do, as much as, as we did then. Um, certainly there's been some genetic mutations, things like black, which we can definitely talk about there, I'd love to. Um, you know, uh, lactase persistence. So some over the past 10,000 years, some uh, populations have developed the ability to um, produce the enzyme lactase, which breaks down lactose as adults. Certainly we've seen that happen. Um, we've probably seen some genetic mutations that allow us to allow certain populations definitely as children to do better with gluten than others. And there's a few things like that, but for the most part, essentially are the diets that built us biologically, the diets that built us as a species um, to uh, provide the same nutrition that we would need today as a species. So basically what I'm hearing you say is this argument that what are we designed to eat isn't really so relevant because we should really be looking at um, what are our technologies that have, you know, allowed us to take something, process it, and this is a question I'm going to get into uh, right after this, um, process it and make it as, as nutrient dense and bioavailable as possible. So that's what I want to ask you next. Um, I want to paraphrase, paraphrase first something that you said in another yeah. talk that you gave. So the failure of our modern food system is that it produces such nutrient depleted food that for the first time on our planet, we can have obesity and malnutrition in the same individual. Today, I want to interrupt the show to talk about magnesium, but not just any old magnesium, a formulation that I found called magnesium breakthrough by the bio optimizers. As someone who has had crappy sleep for pretty much all of my life, I've noticed that taking this before sleep in combination with a bunch of other things, of course, has actually made me feel significantly sleepier before bed and has improved my sleep quality. I won't ever claim one thing is everything, but these habits all stack up and magnesium definitely has been a big contributor to getting good quality sleep and lowering my stress. Why? Well, magnesium is actually anti-anxiolytic. There's some research showing that it helps promote calm in the face of mental and emotional stress. And there's actually an inverse relationship between the amount of stress you have and the amount of magnesium you have in the body. Now, it's also super important for metabolic health, like keeping you insulin sensitive, having regulated blood sugar, and even blood pressure. Now, it's so important because magnesium is highly depleted from our soils because of modern agricultural methods. And finally, it includes naturally derived forms of all seven forms of supplemental magnesium. Now, this is really important because magnesium breakthrough, you get all seven forms and they get absorbed better and utilized better in specific parts of the body. Now, since you're a loyal podcast listener, BioOptimizers is offering 10% off using my link. The link is in the description. Now, back to the show. So for, for all of evolutionary history, like you were talking about, we, we developed these technologies to be able, for the main purpose, to enhance nutrient availability. And now we've done the opposite. And now we value uh, profitability, shelf life, and all these other things. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that is, that is, that statement is something I think about all the time. And when I realized that, and I'm certainly not the only person that's realized that, but when I, when I actually came to that realization, um, it blew my mind because I do think the way we think about food, the way we frame it in our minds um, uh, impacts so many, you know, trickles down to every part of our decisions about how we feed ourselves and how we feed our families and how we feed our communities. That that understanding is an incredibly important place to start with. So let me, let me mention, uh, start with this real quick. Uh, so we partway through the filming of the great human race, I had a conversation. I was a little bit frustrated. Um, certainly I was exhausted and tired and beat up and whatever, but uh, I had a conversation with the showrunner 
great guy, Pete Delasso. And I said, listen, man, this, I, I know Matt Geo is taking advantage of the survival TV genre thing and the wave and all this, like I mentioned earlier, but you know, I don't think it's the most accurate way to depict the past. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, the story of our evolutionary past over the past three and a half million years is not one of survival. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, well, before you guys contacted me uh, about doing the show, my students in one of my classes were, uh, it, was a, it was a primitive technology and experimental archaeology class, uh, Naked and Afraid was getting to be a big show at that time. And they, uh, they wanted me to be on it. And they kept pushing me to, to be on the show. And I'm like, you know what? I, there's a couple things about Naked and Afraid that I like. You know, one thing is it shows how weak we are as a species, that we need to make a tool to do anything. Uh, but I, I didn't really necessarily want to be on, on that show. So I, but I didn't want to tell the students that. And I, um, I went to my wife. I said, you know what? My wife is never going to let me be on this show. So if I go to her and ask her to be on the show, she's going to say no. And then I can go back to the students and save face and say, hey, my wife won't let me do it. I don't know what to say. So I went to her and we were upstairs in the bedroom and uh, she was sitting on the bed. And I said, Christina, um, the students want me to be on Naked and Afraid. What do you think? And she'd seen the show. And she says, she thinks about it, she thinks about it. She goes, it'd be fine with me. Wait, it'd be fine. Wait, everything ain't crushing down. Like my whole plan got destroyed. I said, what do you mean it'd be fine with you? She's like, look, I've seen the show. Like sometimes in the beginning, people come in, it's usually the guy and he's definitely got sex on the brain. He said, but, but after a day, like after two days of getting eaten by mosquitoes and poison ivy and bugs and chiggers and starving and sunburn, it's the last thing on anybody's mind. And I'm like, you're absolutely right. And I was, I'm telling Pete, I said, Pete, listen, the story of our evolutionary past is not one of survival. Species that are right at the edge of survival don't have sex. And if they do, the woman the, the, or, the, or the female has a very difficult time bringing that baby to full term and delivering a healthy baby. And most importantly, even if you got to that point, the most nutritionally expensive time in a female's, definitely human female's life is during lactation, more so than when she was a kid, more so than when she was pregnant. When she's lactating, her nutritional, um, her nutritional requirements skyrocket. So again, if you got through the first stage and you, and you created a baby, you get through the second stage, you delivered a baby, that last stage, if you're right on the edge of survival, the ability to feed that child and protect that child to the point where they can fend for themselves and then replicate that process, generation after generation after generation is impossible. And then to do that, and at the same time, our bodies and our brains are exponentially growing because we're getting such incredible nutrition for our environment. That's not the story. The story of our evolutionary past is one at minimum of, subs of subsistence, mm -hmm. but really it's one of, of, of thriving. It's doing really, really well. Now that isn't to say, you know, it isn't to paint this gorgeous, you know, flowery picture of the past where you're just, you know, everybody's kumbaya and eating this amazing food. Now, generate, there was, there was, people died, populations died, there were plagues, there were all sorts of things. But in general, as a species, over three and a half million years, that's the story. That's the reality. So technology plays such an important role in that, that that means we were creating technologies and approaches to our environment, no matter where our ancestors found themselves in the world no matter what the resources were, that we kept accessing more and more incredibly nutritious and diverse resources. And most importantly, because we have these weak digestive tracts, using technologies to make them as safe, nutrient dense and bioavailable as possible. That's the story of the past three and a half million years. Now the difference is, and the point that you made earlier when you, when you um, mentioned that thing I said about obesity and malnutrition, it's the opposite now. Like food processing in the past was this, in general, this magnificent, wonderful, nourishing thing. It was a necessity, in fact. Food processing today is for a different reason, for different reasons, like you mentioned. There were uh, food manufacturers, <clears throat> no matter what they market, no matter what they say in commercials, they do not care about your health. They care about money. They care about shelf life and all the things that translate into money, shelf life, the ability to store and the ability to ship, the, you know, all the uniformity and packaging, all that sort of, that's what they care about. And, um, and if that was what they cared about and they still were able to increase nutrient density, bioavailability, safety, fine. 
but unfortunately most of those things uh, are done at the expense of nutrient density, nutrient bioavailability, and nutrient safety. So it should be impossible. It should be impossible to be obese. Like it should be. Like it requires. Um, you know, we are hardwired, just like every other animal, through evolutionary processes, through millions and millions of years. To you know, the reason that, and I know I'm jumping around, but there's so many important things to say. The the, the reason that food, eating food is such a sensual experience. And I don't mean sensual in a sexual sense. I mean sensual in the fact that all of your senses are firing at the same time when you're eating. And there's uh, incredible emotional and biological responses to eating. It's, it's not a mistake. It's because eating, the, the three things that we need to do to continue um, to survive as a species, we need to do them successfully, is procreate, remain safe and nourish ourselves. That's what we need to do. And if we do all three of those things, then we can reproduce and produce viable offspring and they can reproduce and this continues and we survive as a species. Every species does this. So those three things in our life elicit the most sensual and uh, strongest responses when we do them right and when we do them wrong. Sex, safety and fear and eating. So, that's why. So we shouldn't be able to eat ourselves to the point where we're making ourselves sick. Right? That's why we have things like satiation. That's why we have these all these responses when we eat. That, but what we've done is we've monkeyed around with our food so hard that we've and we have people literally people in lab coats that are creating flavors and fake things in foods to trick those evolutionary uh, created senses to the point where we can overeat. And that should have been impossible, but yes, we figured it out. And, we, and, and the food industry is doing a, a fantastic job of, of allowing us to become obese. But the craziest part, which is the part that you mentioned, is that not only can we eat so much that we become obese, but the food that the modern food industry is creating is so incredibly free of nutrients that you can eat so much food, you, you become obese. And in many cases, you would still be malnourished. And that is literally the exact opposite of what's been going on for three and a half million years. And it, it's something that we really need, I'm so glad you brought it up, really need to think about if we're gonna make the changes that we need to make. So we've solved the problem of hunger, but a calorie is not a calorie and we've stripped all the food of nutrients. We have made it hyper palatable. We've made it so ultra refined that it's not even filling anymore. It's not satiating, which means we can eat basically if you think about it, take a piece of white bread, you can eat probably an unlimited amount of that without feeling satiated and full. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I mean, I 100% agree with everything that you've said. And that's why I wanted to get you on the podcast to get <laughs> to get all of these thoughts. Well, and, and, and why would the food industry, why would the food industry want you to be satiated? You'd stop buying food, right? They want, they want to elicit those responses so that you start eating and not shut it down. Like that's exactly what they want. And, and, and the marketing reflects this, right? The marketing, um, uh, and I've said this before, it was a study done and I cannot find this study. So if anybody finds it, I can't, but I, I read it about five or six years ago, but there was a study done where, where they looked at a whole bunch of grocery stores and looked at the, the, the uh, marketing or the labeling on the packaged food, right? So not the meat section, not the produce section, but all the, all the areas of the aisles in the middle of the grocery store and something like 80% of the packaged food, the major advertising scheme on those foods were, was what it didn't have in it. it. It wasn't telling you, hey, I've got this much protein, I've got this much fat, I've got, it was saying, I, it is, it is sugar-free, low-carb, low-calorie, fat-free, you know, what, whatever it is. And a lot of those things I'm not suggesting we need to have in our diets, but it's back to that whole um, up, up, thinking about food, that approach to food. We as modern, you know, in the past, our ancestors wanted to get the most amount of nutrition with the least amount of work possible. I mean, that, that, that was the goal, right? To get the most amount of nutrition while exerting the least amount of energy um, to get that food and to get those nutrients. But now it's the opposite. We want it as Americans, whether we uh, uh, accept this or not, most of us want, you know, eating is a very social experience. Um, we, we find pleasure in eating and sitting there talking to somebody munching on chips or whatever it is. So uh, we 
seek nutrient-free foods. We want to eat all day long and not get fat. I mean, that's what we want to do. So we actually do the exact opposite of our ancestors. And I'm not, and what I'm about to say is not suggesting we shouldn't exercise, but just bear with me for a second. If, if you know, our ancestors certainly lived a very active life, you know, whether they were running after animals or grinding maize or whatever they were doing, they were, they were, they were exerting themselves quite a bit. And we modern people are, are couch potatoes. But if that, that mindset in the past of getting the most amount of nutrition where it needs to be in our bodies with the least amount of work, I think is a great way to think about the past. But today we want to eat all day long. We uh, not get fat. We buy foods that boast uh, what it doesn't have in it. And then we buy gym memberships to go work out really hard. Um, and again, I'm not, I'm not suggesting we don't go into the gym, but the, the idea that we're trying to eat a whole lot of food and work out really hard so we can eat more food is is a really weird way to think about it. And that's one of the reasons I really like uh, some of the um, approaches now to, to, to thinking, at least putting into our, our mindset, things like fasting or intermittent fasting and the like, which is a whole other topic. But um, that mindset change, that mindset, our mindsets need to shift. We need to think about food, which is the thing I didn't do for most of my life, as something that nourishes us. Um, we need to think about food as something that, uh, provides us the nutrition we need to live our optimal lives uh, true um, we need to try our we need to do everything that we can to make the foods we have access to as safe as possible we need to do everything we can to increase the nutrient density of those foods and just as importantly i call it the can of soup effect but we need to realize that just because we put a nutrient in our mouth doesn't mean it automatically goes to where it needs to go to in our bodies right um uh, uh, what's his, I forget his name. Um, who wrote Plant Paradox? Um, Stephen uh, Gundry. Stephen Gundry. Yep. He made a great analogy in, in Plant Paradox where he said, you know, putting food into your mouth doesn't mean it goes into your body. Our digestive tract should be, you know, we should think about it like a Lincoln tunnel. You know, the only thing you can guarantee is it goes in this end and comes out the other. It needs to be in the right state. Your body needs to be healthy. Everything needs to work the right way so that the nutrients that are there actually goes through the, you know, your small intestinal walls and gets distributed to the place it needs to go into your body. So all of those things, um, you know, need to happen. So biologically, we need to think of food in that way. But here's the other key that I think we haven't talked about much at all, but I think is, is, is crucial. And it, it goes back to a point you made earlier. I do truly believe that the foundation of the diets we should be eating today should uh, come from the way that we have been eating in the past, especially the kind of diets we had somewhere around 300,000 years ago, because that's the diet that literally built us the way that we are today. So that should be the foundation. Biologically, we haven't changed that much, at least not enough to use that as the foundation. But what has changed and is a crucial component of the human experience of food is are the cultural piece. Like we have changed culturally a huge amount since five years ago. We've changed culturally a great amount since 300,000 years ago. And since food is so intertwined with everything that it means to be human, it's intertwined with politics and religion and tradition and you know, all socioeconomics, all sorts of things. It's national, it's, it, 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 it is intertwined with every part of our life that we can't escape the fact that we eat for both uh, nutrition and we eat for uh, an emotional response. And true health is grounded in making sure we satisfy both of those things. So even if I knew exactly what a diet was 300,000 years ago and put it on the table in front of you, and even if I convinced you that this is biologically the healthiest diet on the planet, um, you might eat it, no matter what it looked like or smelled like or <laughs> whatever. Uh, and you might eat it tomorrow, but next week, a month later, two months later, you're probably not gonna eat it. Your kids are certainly not gonna eat it, right? So. Um, what do we have to do? And in my mind, and this is where a lot of my work is focused on now, we have to take those technologies and approaches to food that transform it into its safest and most nourishing form and combine it, recognize our cultural expectations of things like flavor and, uh, and aroma and presentation, uh, uh, recognize those things and use really the modern uh, culinary arts approach to things and fuse all of that together to create diets that are meaningful and accessible and relevant in our modern lives. That's how we achieve true health. That's how we um, uh, provide a platform 
that doesn't just fizzle out in a couple weeks or a couple months or a couple years. I also don't believe, even though I am a huge advocate of understanding our ancestral dietary past to inform our modern dietary present and future, I don't think the ideal human diet has ever been created. I don't think it has. Our diets in the past were a lot better than they are now, but I don't want us to have that perception that that was the ideal diet and we need that diet today and we're gonna, everything's going to be fine. What, what, what I, I, if, and this is also another reason why I don't like to cut off, you know, this sort of anything pre-agriculture was good, anything since then is bad. Well, that's, that's silly. I mean, that's uh, somewhat ignorant. Um, we've done a lot of amazing things with food since the agricultural revolution, and we're going to continue to do so. And if our approach is, hey, let's use technology for the right reasons, like we always have, for making food safe nourishing, as uh, safe and nourishing as possible, then what new things can we do? Like there were, there's been a lot of stuff already, but there's new things we can do. Technology is not inherently bad. So if, if we take that approach, recognize that there's a biological and cultural element to, to food and diet and health and use technology the right way, I think, um, you know, I, I think the future of food can be better than anything in the past ever was. So to emphasize the main points here to finish off, we can't out-exercise a bad diet. The focus <laughs> should be on nutrition. Um, and something that goes around in the fitness world is abs are made in the kitchen, which I, I agree with. Um, we need to start focusing on processing food to make it more digestible, to make it more nutritious, and to make it more delicious. I mean, that's, that's how we maintain that long-term diet. We make it actually pleasurable. I mean, we have those taste buds for a reason, right? We're, let's make it delicious too. So uh, yeah, now to finish off, we're going to get into the rapid fire rounds. I want to get your thoughts on a few things okay. quickly before we Quick finish answers off. you're looking for, right? <laughs> <laughs> so number one uh, question I ask everybody, what is the most important habit you personally do every day to support your mental and physical health? <laughs> Ooh, that's a great, great truth. Kiss my wife first thing in the morning. <laughs> and, and I know that has nothing to do with food, but um, kiss my wife every morning. Kiss my wife and kids every morning. Absolutely. What is the most important lesson you've learned recently? There's so many, and, and I love, I know this is a short answer version, but I say one thing. One thing I love, I, I, I love a lot about Paul Saladino's work. But one of the things I love about something Paul Saladino did recently was he was not afraid to admit that he's learned a lot since he even wrote you know, that last book. Um, and he would have even changed some of the things in the book because of things that he's learned since then. And, and I'm, I'm in the midst, my, uh, um, my, my book's gonna be on pre-order in March. I'm in the midst of changing a few things now and just that process, seeing how things, I, I'm always learning. There's a ton of things that I've learned, but something more recently that, that I've learned uh, that has changed my mindset a little bit and opened my eyes, um, especially in the fasting world is the, uh, you know, I always had the perception that a healthy human body should always be digesting food. Like we should be eating all, you know, I grew up in that in the seventies and eighties where you're supposed to be eating like six or seven, eight, you know, small meals a day. And you should always, always be eating, which means by default, you should always be digesting. And the idea that, you know, homeostasis for the body is not eating and not digesting. Like you don't need to be eating all day long. You don't need to be digesting food all day long. In fact, that the taxing on the body um, really has changed my mindset and has transformed the way that I approach food and, and, and the way that I eat throughout the day. So it's probably, probably the value in period, longer periods of time during the day or during the week that, that I'm not consuming food. Awesome. Now, the vegan diet. That's the only prompt you give me. That's, that's, the, that's the question, the vegan diet. Um, again, I, I, I think, to start off, most, as far as I understand it, most vegans are vegans for either nutritional reasons, ethical reasons, or sustainability reasons, or a combination of all of them. And like I said earlier, I place huge value on all of those things. And I think they're very honorable um, things to think about when you're approaching food. In fact, most people don't think about food enough and, and how they're eating it and, and the impact on their own health and the health of the planet. So I think it's, I think, the approach is well-intentioned. I think the outcome is incredibly dangerous. Um, I, I don't think it's sustainable. I, I think, unfortunately, all the pillars fall, fall, fall down. Um, all, all three of those pillars fall down when you really look into it and dive into it. it, is, it is, I've never seen a, 
uh, any evidence for any prehistoric group around the world that chose to not eat animals when they had access to them, which is, I think is very, very telling. Um, I would say, and with two different, two other things. One is um, my uh, approach to food and diet and health is grounded, and we've said it numerous times throughout this hour, in using technologies to make food as safe and nourishing as possible. And I do think that approach can help make a vegan diet more safe and more nourishing. So things like, you know, eating a, a, a vegan diet, if you're gonna stay a vegan, at least start to consider there are ways of approaching those plants to make them safer and more nourishing because plants in my mind are inherently dangerous. They all have toxins. Um, and things like oxalates are, are, are should be huge um, dangers that vegans should be aware of. So number one, I think that uh, if, if you're not going to, if you have a vegan diet, I applaud you for why you're doing it. I think you should consider uh, that in the context of our ancestral past. Um, if you're going to stay a vegan, then do everything that you can to ensure that what you're eating, it's not just that you've imported chickpeas and peanuts and whatever else from all over the world, but what are you doing to those foods to make them as safe and nourishing as possible for you? And I would also really take a good self-reflective and open-eyed look at the entirety of what the human experience is. And, and it, it, sh it isn't black and white, uh, the human experience with food. It isn't, um, you know, eat industrial meat or be a vegan. I mean, it, it, no, those aren't, those shouldn't be, if those are your, if those are the parameters that you're working under, then you're not thinking deep, even though you're thinking, you're not thinking deep enough about it. My family does not eat uh, industrial, industrial meat. My family is not a part of that system. We eat an incredible amount of animals um, in our diets. But there's two things I think are uh, important about the way that we choose to answer those questions about um, nourishment, sustainability, and ethics. Instead of um, ignoring and, and, and removing myself from the entire system, and it's still happening over here, and not eating meat, what we do is we get as close to it as we can. Right, so we do the exact opposite. We hunt for most of our most of our meat. Um, when we don't, the meat we do eat that we haven't hunted, we know the butcher and the per, and the farmer that raised that animal, and the abattoir. We do most of the butchering at home. We eat a complete nose to tail approach. In fact, I taught a, a, a class, a virtual class last night on on uh, different ways of cooking offal. We eat from one end of the animal to the other. That is a completely different system than buying a McDonald's hamburger, right? It, 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 and and it just like I mentioned earlier, the how part is so important and critical to the way we approach food uh, and, and things like fermentation and cooking. Well, it's the same thing with, with animals. The, how, the major how part in animals is how closely connected are you to the source of where that animal comes from? Um, how much of that animal have you used? Are you eating that entire animal? Are you just eating chicken breasts? They're completely different worlds. Um, so I hope that answers your question. <laughs> that was awesome. That was basically the core of my interview with, with Brian Sanders. Was it? Yes, exactly. Pretty much every point that you mentioned. So yeah, that was a great answer. Um, last, last question, because I know we're almost running out of time here. Sure. Um, there's a lot of debate between raw milk versus pasteurized milk. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, oh God, as a quick, you want a quick answer? <laughs> um, uh, uh, just like everything else, what I would say is in order to fully understand the debate, it's worth looking at the um, prehistory and history of dairy consumption. Um, it looks like dairy has been consumed for at least, at least 10,000 years. So when I say dairy consumption, I don't mean as infants. We're designed as mammals to drink milk from, from our mothers, right? But uh, as adults, drinking milk from other animals, um, it looks like somewhere between eight and 10,000 years at least is when we really started doing it. Some, some populations started doing this on a more regular basis from other animals. Uh, first evidence for cheese making is about 7,500 years ago in Poland. Um, and cheese is certainly, I'm sorry, fermented dairy in general is, is at the core of many indigenous and traditional diets around the world. And um, you know, we need to understand that. We also need to understand the uh, series of events that led up to widespread pasteurization of milk, especially in the late 19th, early 20th century. And the, the quick sort of takeaway from that is 
the dairy industry at that time in this country, especially surrounding cities, was so incredibly poor and horrible that people, babies especially, but people were getting sick and dying from milk across the country. Um, and most people then said, well, of course, pasteurization was the answer. Well, pasteurization was really one of two answers that could have addressed the problem. One answer is to take this in, in, in incredibly horrendous, sickening, disgusting milk and boil it to kill off anything that's in it, right? And right. and serve what we call safe milk to the public, but it's safe, terrible milk, right? It, it's safe because it's, safe it's not gonna kill you, but it really doesn't have a whole lot of good stuff in it. Or transform the entire dairy industry and make it more reflective of what it's been for 10,000 years when nobody was getting sick. I mean, those are the two choices. And certainly the one was chosen because it was cheap and easy and what have you. Um, and now it's been so ingrained in us that we think, raw milk is inherently dangerous and pasteurized milk is inherently safe. And that's the wrong way to think about it. I, I will say raw milk can be incredibly dangerous, um, but good raw milk, good raw milk is and just like anything else. When I say good raw milk, just like with the meat, if you don't have a cow or a goat yourself, then you should know the person milking that cow. And that person milking that cow should know your kid's names and should know the cow's name. And if that's the case, then you're probably getting milk that is inherently as safe as possible with a very tight, you know, small food system. That's great. Um, but so we drink and have since the kids were born exclusively raw milk in our house. And unfortunately, I have every week or two, I have to break federal law, state and federal law and go get milk in another state because it's not legal. It's not legal in Jersey when we live there. It's not legal in Maryland where we live now. Um, but I, I would add one quick little thing to that. The argument shouldn't just be raw versus pasteurized milk. Um, this is where the technology plays a key crucial role in the discussion. Very few, I know Brian Sanders right now is, uh, he's either with right now or he's gonna be working with the Maasai very soon. I spent a lot of time with the Sambaro who are, are very similar in their approach to, to milk. They do drink raw milk. That's a major part of their diet, but they are two of the only groups that I know of that have a diet built on dairy that don't ferment the dairy. Almost every single traditional approach to dairy from butter to kefir to yogurt to cheese to clabber and a whole host of other things I didn't even mention is all fermented. And it's that fermentation process that is crucial to the um, to making that dairy as safe and nourishing as possible to our bodies. And this is a much longer discussion than we have for now, but I'll, I'll leave the, the, the piece with this. When we as infants consume dairy, and believe it or not, when we're infants and mammals in general, it, it is it is the one of the, it is the, we are perfectly, it's the only time in our life that we humans are actually eating a diet that our bodies are perfectly suited to eat. Right? We are designed as infants to drink raw milk from our mothers, just like every other mammal. Now, when we start to get weaned off, off of breast milk, um, we have some biological changes that make it more difficult, but we're perfectly suited to drink that milk as infants, just like a cow is perfectly suited to eat grass and a, a, you know, a goose is perfectly suited to eat grains. But we are suited for that. That's the only time in our life we're eating a diet we're perfectly suited for. And then we change. And then we introduce all these other foods that we have to do all these technologies for. And quite often when we're, when we're using technologies to transform other uh, resources into their safest and most nourishing form, we're mimicking what other animals naturally do in their bodies. But with dairy, here's the really cool thing. When we ferment dairy, we're actually mimicking what we did as infants in our bodies that, uh, when we were designed to actually consume that milk, right? So it isn't that we drank milk, we drank milk from our mothers and you know that was it. And oh well, you know what? Me drinking uh, you know a gallon of pasteurized Pelzer pasteurized milk from Acme is the same thing. No, no, no. That milk coming from your mother was teeming with bacteria. It was fermenting as it left her breast. It was fermenting as it went into your bodies. It got hit with an enzyme called chymosin that coagulated it, which is exactly the same uh, enzyme we use when we make cheese. It solidified it a little bit so it slows down in our digestive tract so it can fully chemically and physically break down. It ferments while it's in there, breaks down more fully. And in essence, what we're doing as infants when we um, are digesting 
milk from our mothers is we're actually making cheese in our stomachs. So um, there is a huge debate to have about raw versus pasteurized milk. Homogenization is even worse, but the larger um, thing we should be focusing on is actually fermenting dairy to make it as safe and nourishing as possible. Oh man, now I feel bad about asking this question right at the end here. I know we barely <laughs> no scratched the surface. <laughs> uh, There's a lot to talk about there, a lot to unpack. Yeah, so how can people find out more about you, uh, your work? I know you have some really cool courses that I was about to uh, buy myself. Uh, so where can people find that stuff? Awesome, there's a couple of places you can find me and the work me and my, me and my wife and my family are doing. Uh, so first off, our website is eatlikeahuman.com. And there you'll find our blog, a bunch of information, information on our courses. So we do uh, pre-recorded classes, live virtual classes. Uh, we do some in-person classes now, but we will be doing a lot more certainly when the world opens up again. And these are courses on everything from foraging and stone tool production to all sorts of advanced cooking classes, butchering nose to tail, sourdough, those sorts of things, fermenting. Um, so you can find all that information on our website. You can find me on social media at, at Dr. Bill Schindler. So at Dr. Bill Schindler on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And um, just a, a quick little plug for the work we're doing here at Washington College. You mentioned it in the beginning intro. Uh, years ago, I designed the Eastern Shore Food Lab, which is where I'm, I'm coming to you from today, which is a, an incredible, innovative teaching and learning and, and research space uh, here at Washington College in Chestertown, Maryland. So if you look up uh, Washington College or washcall.edu and type in Food Lab, you can see the work we're, we're doing here as well. Amazing. Thank you very much for your time, Dr. Schindler. My pleasure. Great to talk to you.